Father, we thank you so much for your blessings in our life. We thank you for the fact that we can gather together, Lord, here still and worship here. We wish we could do it in a, a different kind of a fashion like we used to do it, but we pray that we'll get back to that point. Hopefully over the next few weeks, things will begin to calm down. We pray particularly for the school situations they open up, um, that uh, you'll protect all the teachers and administrators, the boys and girls, teenagers, and keep them healthy and strong, Lord, through it all. And that, Lord willing, the things go onward and the positive case goes down as they've been doing. Um, things would just begin to change a little bit. We pray to just give grace and strength to uh, the leadership over this land and over our state and over other states to help them to do the wise thing. Be with those who continue their treatment uh, uh, throughout uh, the weeks. Uh, Brother David, Sister Winifred, and uh, Brother James, be with them. I pray that you just work through the testing to help it be effective and you just continue to work and guide and, and take care of them. Get the doctor's wisdom every step away. Be with Sister Debbie, help her body to heal from the fall. Thankfully, the ankle wasn't broken, but pray to just take care of her and watch over her. Be with Heather, Lord, as the, uh, she's ready to receive this new child. We pray that everything goes well with the situation. Uh, Mom and baby will be doing well uh, by next week, and uh, rejoicing will be abundant and great and joyful. And to be with Daniel, Lord, to help him just take care of things, be with him, give him grace and strength each step of the way, and work in a great and powerful way. And for others who may be engaged in this virus, give them grace and strength, help them to heal quickly. Um, pray to just be with uh, um, all else in our life. Pray to be with our land and our nation. Give us wisdom even as we plan to, to vote. And uh, I believe there's voting on Tuesday here and down the road in November election for the president and for other issues. Guide and direct the land and the nation. Give us wisdom to do what we need to do. And as we open your word today, Lord, remind us of the reality of who we are and why we're here and challenge us to live a life that honors and seeks to please you. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 11 through verse 16. 1 Peter 2 verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, Abstain from fleshly desires which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, unto governors, unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Many years ago in the 1600s, there was a man named Richard Baxter, who was a Puritan church leader, um, very faithful to God in many different ways. Uh, people said he preached as if he was a dying man, preaching to people who are dying, and preaching as if this is the last message he would ever give. Which is probably not a bad way to do that. I often think that uh, when I stand here and share the word of God, this may be the last time I talk to you. I don't know. Who knows? We don't have any knowledge of that, do you? Maybe the last time you hear me, maybe the last time I speak. We don't know what may happen over the time. Jesus may come before we finish this hour. And uh, we'll be home with him in a glory. Um, but one thing he famously was saying this. This is what dominated his life. It's prayer. Lord, whatever thou wilt, where thou wilt, and when thou wilt. Like Jesus Christ, he was a man that was consumed utterly with doing the will of God in life. And that's really the theme of this passage here. Peter is about, the theme of Peter is to live faithfully for God in light of the times. And chapter 2 is about, we do that by embracing the difference that Christ has made in us. We embrace it by, by yearning for, developing a deep yearning for God's word. We embrace it um, by reminding ourselves uh, who we are and what we are, by boldly proclaiming our, the truth of God as we can. And here it is by simply being committed totally to do the will of God in our life. You see the verse 15, it says, For such, for so is the will of God. Now, throughout Scripture, the will of God is mentioned many different ways. In a general sense, the whole Bible is God's will for us. 
Will means God's desires, what God wants, what God yearns for us as his people to do. Some classes are more specific, and this is one of those specific passages. It details exactly what God's will is. But even in that sense, we're going to look at the will of God in a, in a general sense and then in a more specific sense. The general sense is really in verses 15 and 16. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So the will of God deals with the concept of doing well so we can silence people who are foolish. Now don't misunderstand the word foolish. It does not mean somebody that has no common sense in life. We typically use that phraseology today. A fool is someone that doesn't know how to live life. They just don't understand. They may be highly intelligent, uh, but they have no common sense. They can't just do the normal ways of life um, as they go through. It. But that's not what the word means in the scriptures. It's similar to what I talked about in the book of Proverbs, where it talked about fools all the time. Fools are the opposite of wise. A foolish person here in the scriptures means someone who has rejected God, someone who wants nothing to do with God, someone who wants nothing to do with God's truth, um, someone who has no relationship with God. Remember Proverbs, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And if you don't have wisdom, then you don't have the fear of God. That means you have a relation with God. That's who the foolish people are he's talking about. Those who are, are opposite of God, they want nothing to do with God. And unfortunately, they are not just simply hostile to God and the truth, but they are actively seeking to oppose God and his truth. And so they're critics, we could call them. Put the silence by the minute. So he says, I want you to silence them because they're vocal against God and his truth and against you and your life who follow him. Now, in Peter's day, uh, at this point in time, Christianity was illegal in the Roman Empire. And many times they would say that the Christians were traitors to the Roman Empire, mainly because they refused, refused to worship the emperor. They had worshiped emperor and they refused to do that. So they called them a traitor, almost like it was patriotic for them to worship the emperor. They didn't do that because they worshiped only God. Um, and sometimes they called them cannibals because they ate the blood, the, drink, the flesh of the Lord and drank his blood, which, of course, did not happen. But, and then there are other things going along the way that would deal with those things. And those are few situations of hostility and anger. And so Peter's talking to them because these people are facing those situations and no one's going to get worse. He's telling them, this is what you need to do to silence them. Now, for us today, things are different. Um, we're not illegal here in America. We don't have to go hide in house churches, whatever it is, to be protected. Uh, we can openly share our faith. Um, but, but there is um, opposition. We live in a land, unfortunately, that has become foolish in a spiritual sense. A land and a culture that has rejected God and his truth and wants nothing to do with God and his truth. And so what happens is, instead of a legal type situation, it's become more of what was the proper word, a shaming type situation, they call it, you know, uh, where there's a lot of pressure coming from the media and from social media and so forth. For those who follow God's truth, um, they, they use the shaming tactics of labeling you and putting you in categories, whether they're true or not. It doesn't make any difference. If you hold to God and God's truth, you, you are out of touch with the reality. You are a fool. You are a bigot. You are a racist. You are uh, old-fashioned. Um, you just don't know what you're doing. You don't know anything you're thinking about. And, you know, years ago, if someone had strong convictions about God and his truth, they generally were respected. Um, they, they may not agree with you, but they respected your fact that you had a stance in your life and a belief in your system. And we would respect them. But today, that has changed. Those who stand up for God and his truth are ridiculed and they are mocked and they are humiliated and those who reject God and his truth, they are honored and respected and held up as examples for us to follow. That's our culture we live in today. And so the challenge is the same thing. We want to silence them. That's the will of God. I want you to silence them. That doesn't mean we go out and, and eradicate them from the world. That doesn't mean that. Silence means to put a muzzle on them. It means, and the idea is that always be silencing them. Um, silence their, their words and their talk because they're ignorant. That's what we've got to understand about a lot of people who are unbelievers. Ignorant in the sense that they don't understand what God is and who God is and what God's truth can do in their life. They think that if I choose to follow Christ, I'm going to miss out on everything in this world today. They think by choosing to follow Christ, I'm going to have to reject all this kind of lifestyle. I'm going to miss out on the best things of life. I'm going to miss out on everything in life, and so I don't want to deal with that. 
And they don't understand that when someone follows Christ, they actually experience the best life they possibly can on earth. A life full of joy, full of peace, full of hope, full of satisfaction. A life that deep inside every person really wants and desires desperately. But the only way to get it is through faith in Jesus Christ. They don't understand that at all. So what he's telling you is, I want you to silence them by showing them in your life how that life works in Christ. I want you to silence them, he says, with well-doing. Now, well-doing would be very simple. Um, we do the will of God. What's well-doing? It means that we, we live only for God. That's well-doing. It's made up of two different words. One is the act word, which means to do something or to take action. Then attached to it is a word that means good in the sense of beneficial, in the sense of advantageous for you, a profit for you. Well, to do well has nothing to do with moral stuff. It has to do well in reference to God. We live a life that says, I live only for God. He is all to me, and I'm all to him, and I want to live only for him, and him only do I want to live. And he says, when you, when you carry out that life and are consistent with it, then he says, you silence their critics, because what they're saying to people, people look at you, and they're thinking, well, what they're saying does not match who they are. That doesn't make any sense. I remember years ago, down in the islands, uh, one of my leaders came to me and said, um, do you have a problem with Bobby? I won't give his full name, or you won't know him anyway. But I said, no. I said, what's going on? And he said, well, he's going around the island telling them that you, won't, you refuse to talk to him. You won't say anything to him. And uh, I, I think it's starting to hurt the church. I said, well, I don't know what he's talking about. He said, well, he came into the nursing home. You were there. He said something to you. You didn't respond to him. And I said, look, let me think. I said, I remember sitting down talking to somebody. He came in. I remember him coming in, and I heard like him going, <clears throat> And walked on. I said, I didn't hear anything else. I didn't know he was talking to me. He said, well, that's what I figured. But he's going around telling you stuff. I said, okay, well, I'll pray about it. I'll take care of it. So I prayed for God to work out a situation. And in that next two weeks, we had three funerals. And you understand something about the island. On, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot to do in the island, okay? So a funeral is a big deal event, all right? Everyone comes to funerals. They just come because what else can they do? They come to, some of them come to watch the family mourn and weep. Some come just to support the family, but it's a big gathering, and usually they had at least three pastors involved in every funeral, at least three, if not more, and I usually was there almost all the time, and so God led me to do this. When I came there, I would come there, and there'd be like a group of 50 people around me, and Bobby would be there, so I would go up to Bobby and go, hey, Bobby, how you doing, man? Grab his hand. How you been doing? Good to see you again, buddy. I did it at every funeral, loud as I could. Bobby looked very uncomfortable. After that, I had no problem with Bobby's talk. See, he could talk all he wanted and say, Brother David won't talk to me. They're going, oh, we saw him talk to you. Don't tell us that, buddy. It ain't going to work. My actions silenced the criticism. Now, it may not always do that, but that's what God is trying to tell us. He said, they're out saying things about your life that aren't true. So when you live that is right, it silences their critics. And then he goes on to say, listen, and this is how we should live. Why? Because we're free people. Freedom in Christ means we're set free from the penalty and the power of sin. We're free from that. We're able to have the ability to choose to do what's right or do what God wants us to do. We can choose to do what I want to do choose what God wants me to do. We have the freedom to do that. He says you've got to live that way, but, but make sure you don't use your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness. The word maliciousness is a word for wickedness. That is, he said, there, there's some, sometimes there's a tendency of believers to think that since I'm free, I can do whatever I want to do and live any way I want to live because with no consequences. It's unfortunate people think that way, but there are people that think that way. They did it in, in that time. Um, you know, typically the argument is like, uh, I've got heaven sewn up. I know I'm going to go ahead when I die, but that's not going to till until I die. So until I die, I'm going to do what I want to do and enjoy my life here because I already got the eternity sewn up and no one's going to care. It's not going to make any difference. They think that I'm free, that means I can do what I want to do. They don't understand that freedom always brings responsibilities. And we're not to live that kind of a life. We're not to live our liberty as a pretext to go out and do what we want to do in life if it violates God's truth. Instead, he says, but, strong adversative, instead of living that way, make sure you live as free people, but as the servants of God. And the word servants is that word for bond slave. Bonsai was one who was completely committed to the will of his master. 
He didn't care about himself. He didn't care about his own needs. He didn't care about what he wanted to do. He lived solely to do the will of his master. And Peter says, listen, as we step out to live this life for God, we've got to understand something. He set us free. That is true. But that freedom should impel us to go to him and say, because you set me free and I love you so much, I'm giving you all of my life and I'm fully committed to doing your will and living for you only every day of my life. He said, that's how we have to live. That will put to silence the critics who come against us. Because we're not hypocrites, we're not fakers, we're not phonies. We make mistakes, yes, but we own up to them and we deal with them as effectively as we can. But our, overall, people look at us and they see something different in us. We're not living for self. We're not living for the world. We're not living for politics or for money. We're living only for God and God alone. And that impacts people's lives. I read a story about a pastor who had a sister named Judy, and she was uh, an unbeliever. He witnessed her many times, but she wasn't interested. She lived a party life. She enjoyed her party life, um, drugs and everything else. She enjoyed everything she could do in life. And no matter how many times he talked to her about Christ, she just pushed it aside and went her merry way. And then at the age of 44, everything changed for her. She found out her husband was having an affair and so got a divorce. And then at the same time, she found out she had breast cancer that had actually progressed and fairly serious. All of a sudden, it's amazing, isn't it, when we get faced with reality of the end of life, things change your perspective all of a sudden. All the part of life didn't make any sense anymore. She was thinking more about what's going to happen when I die. And she went back to her brother, who eventually led her to Jesus Christ and a saving knowledge of her. And he said that his, daughter, his sister changed dramatically. I mean, even though she was going through a lot of surgeries and a lot of pain and suffering, she couldn't wait to tell people about Jesus Christ and what he did for her. And she did everything she could to share the gospel and live faithfully for him, attend church. She was so fervent. In fact, I think he said something like this. Her, her, her fervency for partying was changed to a fervency for Jesus Christ. It meant everything to her. And because of her testimony, her 84-year-old father came to Christ, her ex-husband came to Christ, several nieces came to Christ, and even some friends who used to party with her were so impressed by what God had done in her life, they too came to follow Jesus Christ. You see, she, she, she did well-doing. And she put to silence any of the criticism against her life because she said, my life is different. I've been set free and now I give my life to my master. I'm living only for God. And that impacted people's lives. It will do the same thing for us. Part of the will of God is to live only for him and nothing else. That's in a general sense. But there's a couple of specifics, too, that he talks about uh, earlier on. If you go back up to verse 11. You notice he says, uh, dearly beloved, it's a great term, kind of defines who we are. We are dearly beloved of God, deeply cared by him. We're beloved by each other in the body of Christ. We are people who are uh, interested in one another every way, shape, or form. I beseech you, beg you, as strangers and pilgrims abstain from the fleshly lust that war against the soul. Those stranger pilgrims, they're another way to identify us. Beloved, we're identified by that term, but we're strangers and pilgrims. We've seen those phrases before. Uh, that describes someone who is existing in a land to which they do not belong as a citizen. They're there, they're living beside people who are natives, but they're not belonging there. They're existing. And they have responsibilities, go through everything, but they, they're not a citizen, so therefore they don't have certain rights of a citizen. Well, we're strange programs of this world or of this culture. Um, that means that our values and our standards, uh, our view of life, that which motivates us to do what we do, is radically different from those who don't know Jesus Christ. We don't adopt their values. We don't adopt their standards. We are different because we have been made different by the grace of God and primarily because we have been taken out of the spirit, put into Christ, and therefore we now belong to God. And as Paul says, we have a new kingdom. We are now citizenship of heaven. That's our home. 
That's where we're going to live for eternity. We're citizens of heaven. And maybe the phrase many times used, kingdom citizens, that's who we are. And to do the will of God means that we live here on life as kingdom citizens. We understand that. I'm here, I got responsible for fulfill, but this is not my home. I'm just passing through, looking forward to getting eternity. And I keep all that in my mind, and that impacts how I live every day of my life. And as kingdom citizens, um, we, we notice that he talks about, I want you to, as kingdom citizens, abstain or stay far away from it. I have nothing to do with the fleshly lust that war against the soul. The fleshly lusts are those strong desires that come out of what we call the sin nature with our life. Every one of us are born with a sin nature. And that sin nature shows itself in our sinful activities. And basically, it simply means that before we knew Christ, we lived for self. Basically, the sin, sin nature tells us to be self-centered in our life. Do what we want to do, live what we want to live, don't worry about anybody else, don't care about anybody else. Uh, do whatever you have to take to make yourself happy. Whatever it is, got to do it. And we live that way for a long time. But once we find Jesus Christ, things change. We have a new life implanted in us, a new nature. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell us. So now everything's changed. Now we have a new nature that impels us to live a Christ-centered life, not a self-centered life. But, but you notice he says this, these lusts war against our soul. That, that word actually means they, they wage a campaign against us. It's a military term. It's as if, uh, you know, when uh, they had uh, moved into Iraq and they engaged in a military campaign against Iraq and Saddam Hussein, or where it was in World War II when they began to engage in a military campaign against Germany, against Japan, uh, battles took place. Strategies start happening. Uh, battle, people get engaged in war. He says there's a battle going on in our soul. And the best way to understand it is to understand that even though we have as it says in scriptures, been put to death to the old man, the sin nature, he still exists in our soul. He has been eradicated so he no longer exists. If that were so, you and I would never sin again on earth, which would be a wonderful thing, would it not be? But that doesn't happen. There have been those who have taught in time past that there is an age of perfectionism, that we can reach the point where we're perfect and never sin, but that doesn't simply happen. I've never met any believer that has been sinless. We always send somewhere, it happens. It happens, maybe not outwardly, but up here, thinking, everything else. I mean, we, we, we do that all the time. And why do we do that? Because there's still this in nature there. It sits there. And many times, Satan then uses temptation, throws out the bait, trying to get one of those desires that have come from the sin nature to reach out and grab the bait and act in a way that displeases God. There's a battle going on. Now, sometimes a battle isn't really noticeable in our life. Sometimes it becomes extremely noticeable. Because we're, we're struggling. We all, it's like what Paul said in Romans 7. I, I want to do what God wants me to do, but at the same time, I want to do what I want to do. And, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out what I'm trying to figure out. I can't figure out how to get it done sometimes. It's a battle in my life. And he says that's going to go on throughout our entire spiritual life until we finally go home to be with the Lord. But he says what you have to do as kingdom citizens is to fight back against that battle. Don't just sit there and be passive. We're to put on the whole armor of God so we can stand against the wiles of Satan. And that's what he's talking about. He says, abstain, how do we do that? He says, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. Again, Gentiles are the same as the foolish people. They reject God. Whereas they speak against you as evildoers, same thing. They speak against you, they make accusations, they criticize you for different things, true or not, they do that. They may be by your good works, which they should behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. When he says, have your conversation honest, conversation means your way of life, your everyday activities. Honest means excellent or well. Basically what he means is that as kingdom citizens, we should live as if we belong to God, because we do belong to God. And we live that way. So people look at us and realize, you don't belong to yourself, you belong to God, don't you? Yes, God is my Lord and my Master. I'm going to live only for Him. I'm going to do what He tells me to do. I'm going to be obedient in my life. Even though the culture says don't need to do that, even though the peer pressure says stop doing that, it doesn't make a difference what anybody says. I'm going to do what God wants me to do because I belong to him and he owns me. He's bought me. I'm his. Therefore, I'm going to glorify him in every way, shape, or form. So he says, you live this way out in front of the Gentiles. And notice, interesting is, he says, the good works, same thing as being honest. 
They're going to behold it. The word behold means to pay very close attention to something. People watch us. You may not realize that, but people do watch you. They may not um, stalk you. I don't want to say that. They're not, not following you around town. Um, but they, they may not even know you personally at all. But, but when you interact with them, whether it's at a Walmart or a Publix or anywhere else you may go to or on the beach, um, they watch and they notice how you behave and how you treat people and how you act and how you react. They see it. They watch. You have no idea what you leave in your wake as you move onward in another direction. But hopefully what you leave in your wake is a challenge for them to realize that person lives differently than what I do. Something's different about that person. That's what he's saying. I want you to live that way. Why? Because these Gentile unbelievers are, are paying attention to you. And in the day of visitation, they will glorify God. Now that phrase, day of visitation, is like someone who's an overseer who comes to see how things are going in your life. Um, whether it's by um, looking over, you know, a lot of times in jobs, we have a, a review sometime along the way. You sit down, you supervise, you go over certain things, how you did, how you didn't do, blah, 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 to help you out and do better and everything else. This word here, is always used in reference to a good sense. The visitation isn't to criticize or condemn you. The visitation is something that would be positive and beneficial to you. And as everyone believes that this visitation means that there comes a point where this individual who's an unbeliever will be visited by the Holy Spirit, be convicted of their sins, and they would turn to Jesus Christ and start following him. And when they do, what would they say? They would give God the glory because your life led me to him. That's what he's saying. So you live a certain lifestyle, you live as if you belong to God, you carry out his principles, obey his, his commandments, and as you do so, God will begin to work upon those who don't know him. And when they come to believe and find that wonderful life, they can testify and say, I'm here because of your people, Jesus. They led me to you because of how they behaved and how they were different. I could not resist what they had in their life. They may not name you specifically, but nonetheless, you'd be shocked about how many... Waves come along in people's lives that push them to Christ, and we may to be one of a thousand, but they're going to give God the glory for it all. They're going to say, thank God for your people and how they lived in front of me. I remember reading a story of uh, years ago, years ago, back in the native Indian American emphasis, uh, which was a big battle in the 1800s, you know, as, as America moved further west, um, you know, Unfortunately, things happened that were not correct as they pushed them out of the land and so forth like that. Um, but there were some who, who um, loved them. They saw them as God creations, wanted to share the gospel with them. And they met with a missionary. And uh, it was actually in Buffalo Creek, New York in 1805. And the, the fellow who was there, um, he explained the gospel to them. And uh, there were a lot of Indians there, a lot of chiefs there. One of the chiefs, who was a prominent one, his name was Red Jacket. He said, brother, you say there is but one way to worship and serve the great spirit. We are told that you've been preaching to the white people in this place. These people are our neighbors. We're acquainted with them. We will wait a little while and see what effect your preaching has upon them. If we find it makes them good, makes them honest, and less disposed to cheat us, then we may consider what you've said. Now, of course, it's not really the preaching. It's, it's whether or not they accept the preaching and God's truth and begin to live it up. But the, the fellow is simply saying, okay, we like what you're saying. Sounds good. We want to make sure it works before we're going to accept it. We're going to watch and see what happens. And those who claim to follow Jesus Christ will see how their life is. And if it's what it's supposed to be, if it matches what is said, then we will come back and we will listen. That's a powerful thing to realize, isn't it? You may not realize, there may be somebody this week who is uh, wondering about God, wondering about Jesus, wondering if it's real or not, and maybe they're even praying to God, God, I need to see your people loving. I need to see it in your people's lives. Show me somebody this week that will point me to Jesus Christ by their life. And who knows, you may meet that person this week. You may not do much at all. You may just simply smile and say, have a good day, enjoy yourself, praying for you. Something simple, easy, but that's all it needed to change that person's life and bring them to Christ. That's the will of God. We live as we belong to him.
Because we do belong to him. We live a life that says we're, we're different. That's a kingdom citizen. But we're also supposed to live not as kingdom citizens, but we're supposed to live as citizens of the kingdom. Sounds similar, but I'm going to change it just a little bit. Kingdom citizens belong to God and live that way. A citizen of the kingdom, the priority of life is we live to please God above everything else. Did you notice he talks about politics in a way, I guess you could say? Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. King, supreme, governors. Submit means to put yourselves under the authority of the ordinance of man, meaning our civil laws. Uh, of course, we don't have kings, but that relates to the one who is in charge predominantly. We, we, we classify as a president or House of Congress, the senators. We got a governor. We got, we got a senate here. We got, in other words, all those in leadership over you, they enact legislation upon which, and you are supposed to follow it and obey it. And he explains why government is here quickly, not, not much in deep than what Paul does, but he says very quickly, he says, they're, they're there, sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them to do well. Paul explains it more in Romans 13. He says, God has ordained government as a institution in our life. And the primary role of it is to protect the law-abiding citizens by punishing those who are not law-abiding, providing a safe environment for us to live in so we can then have the freedom to do what we need to do, particularly as believers who share the gospel of Christ. When government ceases to do that, then there's a big problem. Thankfully, we don't see that here, but you see it over in Portland. You see it in Seattle. You see it in Chicago. You see it in other areas where instead of seeking to enforce the law, they're actually telling people back away and let them do what they want to do. And it's a terrifying place to have to live in that situation completely. But that's the purpose of government. In fact, that's the only purpose of government. It's not to educate, not to give health care, not to do anything else. Um, when government expands, it gets much more complicated where we are today. But nonetheless, he simply says, okay, here's the rule. When government enacts legislation, you should submit to them and obey them because that obedience says something to people around you. But you notice what he says. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Why? So it won't get punished? So it won't get a fine? So it won't go to jail? No. You do it for the Lord's sake. In fact, the word for means on account of the Lord. That's what you do it for. In other words... I obey the speed limit, not because I don't want to get a ticket. I obey the speed limit because I want to please my God. I want to please him. I want to please him to do what I'm going to do. I am honest and try not to cheat people. Why? Because I please God above everything else. You know, I've known pastors that cheat on their taxes. I don't know personally, but I've heard of them, I guess you should say. You know how they cheat? When, what, what they do is this. They, they pad their, you know, there is a I guess it still is. I have never, ever done it. It just was too complicated for me to fool with. But you're allowed to deduct mileage for your business. And, uh, you know, so, um, like, if I would travel from home to visit in a hospital, that's, that's part of my business. I could add up the miles and deduct that from my taxes. And there are pastors who pad that. They add miles to it to make it more. And... I read articles where people talk to me and go, well, government has more money than it needs. What difference is it? They don't care. Who cares? What difference does it make? Well, to me, it makes a big difference. Because when you cheat on that, you're saying to people, I'm not interested in following God. I'm not interested in pleading God. I'm interested in doing what I want to do. That's a dangerous place for anybody to be, much less a pastor. We can't live that way. We are ones who seek to please God, and pleasing God means that we strive as best as we can to obey the laws that are around us. That's, our, that's why we're here. But even as I say that, we understand that there is an implication, though, here and in Romans, that if the government over us enacts legislation that urges us to violate God's principles, it doesn't change our philosophy. Our goal is to please God. And if we obey this law that displeases God, well, then we can't obey that law. There's a difference. You realize that, don't you? I mean, Peter wrote these words. Back in Acts chapter 5, the religious leaders of the day, they arrested Peter and the apostles, put him in jail. God set them free, and they go, they tell the guys to go, go get them, bring them here, we want to talk to them. They go, and they said, they're gone. They're not here. We don't know where they are. So what do you mean they're gone? They're gone. The guy comes, hey, those guys you arrested yesterday and put in jail, they're on the streets in Jerusalem preaching about Jesus Christ. And they said, what? You can't do that. So they bring him back in again. And they say, didn't we tell you not to preach in Jesus' name anymore? And what Peter said, 
we have to obey God rather than man. Meaning your law violates God's law. And we are here as disciples of Christ. And our goal and our whole purpose of living is to share the truth of Jesus Christ. And we will not stop it even though you tell us to. No matter what it's going to cost us. And it costs most of them their life. I mean, I don't think that happens very often. But, you know, there is that situation understanding. We see it somewhere in the Old Testament a couple of times. The midwives are told to destroy the babies. They refuse to do that. Rahab didn't turn over the spies because she knew they'd be dead. She lied. But at the same time, there's a higher reason for what they did accordingly. And hopefully we'll never have to come to that here in America. But I don't know. It may get worse before it gets better here in America, particularly what happens over the next few months. But it doesn't make any difference. Our goal is to please God. And right now, we seek to obey the legislation of Brown's. But what we can do, if there's something that happens and they command us to do something that violates the cure principles of God, then we have to still please God because that's our life. And by so doing, we'll still make an impact on people. Because that's what the focus and goal in every life. I just saw recently that John MacArthur has a massive church in California. Um, put the lawsuit and sued, saying that they were not allowed to have indoor services. And the lawsuit said that, you know, this doesn't seem to apply for other organizations, other groups, only the churches, and the judge ruled in his favor. So he kind of fought back a little bit in a loving, kind way. And he said, I'll buy by everything the judge says, but at the same time, I don't think it was correct for the governor to issue a ban on all services when he allows other things to take place too. So, I mean, that's, it's okay to do that, but we've got to be very wise, very careful in all that we do and all that we say. Because overall, our focus wants to be, I want people out there to realize I love God, I want to please him. I don't want them to see me as a lawbreaker and someone who cares the only thing for laws. I want to see me as someone who loves God deeply and whose life is seeking to please God above everything else. And I show that by a simple, consistent obedience even to the laws of man around me. That's how we're supposed to live. Our goal is to please God above everything else. This fellow named Will Horton he was a pastor for many years. Eventually, he became president of Moody Bible Institute. And uh, I think that also involved that he was also involved in the church. And kind of the pastor there preached there many times. And uh, in the city of Chicago, there was a man who was an agnostic, atheist, having a hard time in life, didn't believe in God. And he was contemplating suicide. Nothing worth living for. But as he was thinking about it, he thought about a little bit more about well, what would happen to me if I die. Maybe, maybe I should think a little bit more. And he heard of this Will Horton coming to town. And he said, you know, if I could find just one preacher who lives as he preaches, maybe I listen to him. And who knows? So he actually hired a private investigator to shadow Reverend Horton, to watch him pay attention to everything he does as best as he could do so. He did so for several months. He came back and he said, I can't find anything in this man's life that disqualifies him in any way, shape, or form. Kind of like Daniel. He said he's honest. He does what he says. He preaches. I can't find anything. So he goes, okay. So he started going to church, listening to Reverend Holton preach. Well, eventually... He turned his life over to Jesus Christ. And even actually sent his daughter to the Bible Institute eventually. For her to be trained there under his ministry. Oh, Mr. Houghton did not have any idea he was being shadowed by anybody. He'd be watching by anybody. But it didn't bother him because he had already committed himself to do the will of God in his life. To live only for God. To walk every day of his life as if he belongs to God. And his top priority in your life was to please God. And that life spoke volumes. So much so that someone was willing to come and say, I'm going to listen to what he says because what he says is how he lives. That shouldn't be just limited to someone like a Mr. Holton. That should be for every one of us, wherever we are, whatever we do. Every one of us be different people in different ways. And every one of us have an opportunity to show by our life the difference Christ has made in us. And if we live that way consistently and faithfully, God will work upon lives of those who are around us. So remember that, all right? We're being watched. May God help us to live a life 
that pleases him, that lives as if we belong to him, and that lives only for him as we are fully committed to doing the will of God in our life. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today thankful for the new life we have in Christ, what it means to us. But again, Lord, I know that sometimes in life things get so complicated and difficult. We sometimes tend to forget, again, why we're here. Forget the wonderful life and the blessings you have given unto us. Forget to realize that we're not here to live for ourselves. We're here to live for you. Just remind us of that, Father, over and over again. Peter and these people in this community here in this time face far more difficult circumstances than we will ever face. Peter himself was martyred for his faith. So are many others. Willing to die rather than disobey you. Willing to die. So they, whatever the cost, is going to please you no matter what happened, even if it cost their entire life, they were not going to stop pleasing you and living for you only. God, help us in our world today, in our country, to live only for you as your people. To be people who are committed fully to your will and to carry it on in their life. And we pray that as we do that, you use us to touch lives and things will be changing. People who see us will come to Christ and we'll rejoice with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. Work in our hearts and use us for thee. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.